In previous videos, I sculpted this guy in clay, made silicone molds of him, and cast him in resin. In this video, I painted him and assembled him. Stick around. I'll show you how I did it. We're going to sand these pieces now. Nice. Got that one flat. This one's got a little bit of work to do. I made the castings in a variety of colors, mostly for fun, but also because colored castings are just easier to see on camera than the white ones. Pure white ones are hard to read. They, it's hard to see them. To say, my partying lines are very, very minor. And it will take very little time to sand them off. If you do the castings well, you don't have a tremendous amount of post cleanup to do. All right, I think we have these pretty well sanded up on this guy. So I'm just hitting them with this uh, Rust-Oleum primer that sticks to plastic, which is why I love it. Just uh, your basic Rust-Oleum. And uh, dries super fast. And it gives a really great result. It was along about this time that I got the idea to put him on roller skates and have him fly in a kite. I just liked the pose better, liked the idea better. So I had to make up a bunch of new parts and it's those parts and pieces that you're going to watch me paint in the rest of this video. One of the things I love about oil paint is that when you put it on your palette, it stays wet for a long time. It stays workable. But that's not true of acrylic. Acrylic has speed going for it. What I don't like about acrylic is that it dries out on the palette really fast, unless you use my brilliant system. And my brilliant system is this. I don't know if I invented this. I may have learned this, but I've been doing this for a long, long time. Took a couple of lids off of, uh, well, just off of lettuce boxes, which make a nice plastic, a nice plastic tray and a nice plastic lid. And then I just put a bunch of sheets of paper towel, just kitchen, kitchen paper towel off a roll. And then here's the secret. This is parchment paper, but you can also use tracing paper or any other vellum or any kind of paper that when you put paint on it, the paint won't absorb into the paper. It just sits on top. So what happens is you put the acrylic on there, it sits on top of the paper, but, and here's the trick, the paper isn't dry, the paper is wet. And I mean really wet, soaking wet. It's like a pool of water in the bottom of this tray. That's why you need the plastic tray underneath, so that you can completely soak the paper. And this means that this, will, this palette, as long as you keep adding water to it, is never going to dry out. Then you put the paper on top, like so. And you can see it's in making contact with the, with the water, the wet blow, and you can feel it. It's cool and it's damp. It's wicking water through it. And then when you put the paint in, it will not dry out. And when you're done, at the end of the day, I just use, just, I like to use matching lid, two matching lids because then I just uh, take a little clips. That's it. Clip them together. And that will stay wet for days and days. It'll stay wet for as long as you keep adding water to it. And then your paints don't dry out. You're welcome. So let's load it up with some white because we're going to start painting with white. This is just gesso. And now we can start to paint. And we're just going to start by slapping a coat of gesso on the base. It's as good as a way as any to get started. This is plain old acrylic gesso out of the gallon jug. We'll just let that sit, put that aside to dry. Now here's the thing. The top of this guy's head is yellow. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down some yellow paint and I'm gonna pick up some gesso. I'm just gonna mix some paint in with gesso for the first coat. That tends to make the paint a lot more opaque than it would otherwise be. And you can just lay on it. It's gonna, it's gonna take, because of that dark gray primer. And by the way, you can make your, your life a little tiny bit easier by using white primer. I happen to have gray primer left over and it works and I'm too cheap to run out and buy white primer just for the color change. 
but you, you get there quicker when you start with white, unless you're going with very dark colors, obviously. So coat number one still has some color in it. That kind of pushes us in the direction of where we're going here. And again, I'm feathering where I don't want a clean line and I don't want to see a paint edge. I feather. And that's how we go. And when I take a break, when I've done some stuff, I take a break and I got to do something else for a while. I just lay the cover back on. I don't even clip it. Just lay it on there. The humidity in there is 100%. It just stays wet for days. It's beautiful. The most important tool in the history of humanity, in the entire course of human history, is the hairdryer, especially if you paint anything in acrylic. Boom, dry. Speeds you along so fast. When you've got to get a job done and you don't want to monkey around, got to have your handy dandy trusty hairdryer by your side. Speaking of crap brushes, holy moly, look at the paint. Look at the hairs fall out of this piece of crap of a brush that I bought. I think, what were these? Let me see. 25 brushes for like seven or eight bucks, something like that. Yeah, yeah. These are uh, not Winsor Newton Series 7s, so let me tell you. But you know what? They work. You don't have to spend a fortune to do art. You really don't. You can, but you don't have to. On the other hand, one place where it's uh, useful to spend some money is on quality paints. The difference between cheap paint and good paint is numbers of coats, basically, and brightness of color, things like that. But if you use really cheap paints or you water them down too much, this and that, you're going to need to put a lot of coats on to get the colors you want because there's not enough pigment in the paint to do the job. But the hairdryer will dry, will dry a coat of paint in seconds. You can see when it goes matte, as you know. That's how you can tell your paint's dry. Is that these are matte paints. These are these uh, ceram coats, and I also use Folk Art and a few other brands. Just your basic uh, big box craft store type paint. Here's another little trick you can use. I'm going to go. I'm going to paint these hands. They're also yellow. So I'm going to get them going, same as I did the top of the head, but they're small and they're hard to hold on to. So one of my little tricks is to take the same wire that's going to be in the puppet to hold on to them and just go ahead and start to paint them. And again, I'm not concerned about, you know, painting the whole thing all at once, this and that. If I can, I will. If I can, I won't bother. And um, let's paint them as much of them as I can. But since, I don't, but since I did paint them all around, and I don't want to set them down, okay, that's not bad for a first coat. What I will do is I'll just jam them into this uh, lump of clay. Boom. Stand them up. You see that? Nice. Just stands them up. Second hand, same as the first hand. Put the paint on, first coat, and so that's just another stellar use for oil clay. Just another use for oil clay. Stuff comes in useful in a lot of different ways. And here's what I was saying earlier about using white primer. On a project like this, I can make a pretty strong argument for white primer. Just would have saved you know a couple of coats of paint here and there for sure, but no big deal. All right, we're just gonna keep on going. And then when you get a whole bunch of things painted up, as I have now, then you can kind of just generically hit the whole area with the hair dryer, dry a lot of parts at once. Just keep pushing through. That's the goal here. Keep pushing through. Sometimes it's hard to jam the paint down into the cracks, so you just have to flood it in there and then brush the excess away. Works okay. These parts actually paint up pretty quick. Another rule that I have about painting, typically, I often paint the undersides of things first. 
there is a really interesting relationship in sculpture with paint because color has the ability to flatten and destroy forms. It also has the ability to enhance forms. So you can enhance texture. You can uh, bring out the sculptural qualities of a piece of anything you're making using color and value and paint, or you can completely flatten it out. You can, you can even negate a form and make it disappear just by how you use pattern, texture, etc. On, on, the, on the paint. When you paint in layers like I'm doing, you get really rich, nice colors. Like that yellow is kind of variegated. It's not a solid color. It's not an out-of-the-jar color. There's definitely lighter and darker kind of patches, but uh, it makes for a rich color. It's nice. Nice. You try to make the edges as clean as you can, but you can always come back in with the other color and kind of touch up, kind of go back and forth. I find I, us I usually have to go back and forth a little bit on the edges. Sometimes I get them in the first shot and sometimes I don't. I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. I flooded the opening of the mouth with the black paint and now I'm gonna have to come back in and retouch the teeth, which I had a feeling I would have to do. Here's a little trick you can use. You just take some uh, fun tack. Sometimes it's called blue tack. There's a bunch of people make this stuff. Anyway, I just stick it on the end of a coffee stirrer and a blob. And what that enables you to do is to hold on to small parts that would otherwise be tricky to paint, like the little eyeballs. So if you don't want to get paint on your hands, painting small parts, this is a really great way to do it. All I'm doing here is just focusing on the one edge, the, the parallel edge of the red stripe. I'm not worried about the top edge. We'll do it in a couple of passes. And again, I'm not worried about achieving perfection. Don't, don't worry about feeling like, hey, I've got to get it perfect on the first shot because you actually can go back with the white and touch up and kind of sharpen up and this and that. It's not the end of the world. If your lines aren't perfectly straight and parallel and all that stuff, a little goofiness is always good in art. The other thing is, too, it's all painted in stages. I don't, uh, I don't worry about trying to get things painted completely the first time around, the first shot. I just do it in stages, do a little at a time on each piece, set it, set it aside, let it dry, come back to it. I'm moving along, and um, earlier I had drilled holes in the bottom on the theory that I could match the legs to where the holes were. Didn't work at all. Total fail. <laughs> so I have determined the bends of the legs and uh, uh, where the holes need to go and all that good stuff. I'm even going to drill a little pilot hole so I kind of see that I know for sure where I'm going in here. And I need to come in to the, to the body, to the torso at a very shallow angle. Something like that. I hope. I think so. Great thing about plastic, you screw it up. I mean, I had to, I had to fill those, the existing holes. And as you can see, great thing about sculpture is <laughs> you can always fill holes. You can always fix stuff. I packed them tight with Magic Sculpt. And uh, no problem, no problem at all. So let's gotta love this like 25 year old serious craftsman drill. Still works. What can I say? Okay, now I'm gonna switch to the eighth inch bit and drill the actual hole for the leg. All right, here goes nothing. Let's go in with the eighth inch bit. See if we get this halfway right, semi right. Nice thing about a pilot hole is you just you just drill straight down. Look at that nice plastic. You just you just go straight down your pilot hole. All right. Let's see. Got it kind of goobered up. May have to do a little work on it. 
All right, let's see if we can move that hole this time to the correct position. <laughs> we keep moving it. Just gonna fill in the center of the belt buckle, just coat the whole thing in yellow. And then I can flood that little pocket down in there easily enough. This is a perfect example of when blue tack comes in handy for painting small parts because there's no way I'm going to be able to hold these little parts, these little bitty tiny eyebrows. So, no worries, just hold them with some blue tack <laughs> and away you go. So we're going to go ahead and paint these little kids. See, this is just like the perfect use for blue tack. Okay, we'll get those coated up. A couple of coats, flip them around, paint the other side. Boom. Done. All right, getting those wheels painted. Coming down towards the end of the paint job here. Getting close now. Again, I'm going to paint this strap red first to blend it in, make sure it's well blended, and then come back in and coat it with black. Now, of course, now I screwed myself because I've got wet paint on both sides, so I'm just going to take a dowel rod and hang it, and just hang it up. So it's a simple way to get your small parts to dry. Just hang them up off a cup, works like a champ. We're just about ready to get to assembling this guy. So we, the question is, is that the right angle? Looks about right. How much am I going to have to glue that on? A little blue tack or glue to hold that shoe on. I think I want it swinging out, and it doesn't. It swings straight down. All right, now we're ready to assemble the face. Push it into place until he's on there. Now that's on there surprisingly well. Let's see if the mouth fits. Or is it too low? Eh, might be a little too low. This is the genius of fun tack. You can always move stuff. It's a little repositionable, which I really like about it. You just have to be careful not to let it bleed out to the edges. Okay, nose is in place. Let's look at the mouth. Yeah, now there's lots of room for the mouth. A little ribbon of fun tack. So far as I can tell, this material does not affect the paint in any way. At least it hasn't on things I've done in the past. So that's good. A couple of eyeballs. I don't mind that there's a little gap between the parts. And the, you do see a little gap. And if you were shooting them from side views and stuff, you might want to adjust it so that you would can you could adjust it for instance you could put a little divot in the back of the instead of a perfectly flat back you could have a little divot in it for a place for the fun tack to live but for our purposes especially today not necessary oh my god he's fantastic beautiful now this is going to be the hardest thing of all these little kids are going to be tricky because I don't want to show a lot of blue tack on them, so I want just a tiniest little pill. Just a teeny tiniest little pill, and I'll see if this will work. I might even be try to make it into a little worm. Let's see if I can get this to work and not show too bad. Obviously, if this was a sculpture and you wanted them to be permanent, you wouldn't do this. You would glue them on. But I am going to tack for the time being. Get this guy tacked on there. That's a big old hunk for such a tiny little piece. Might be too much. You also have to tack it on the right, on the correct side. Okay, let's see about that. What does that look like? Oh, oh, shoot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You kind of see it. Maybe adjusting that somewhat more. And obviously, you're not going to ship this piece. This is just for 
photography and video. Oh my God, he is way cute. All right, perfect. Now then, kind of drop his neck in and I'm considering putting in a little spot of glue way down in there because I don't think it's going to not rotate around like that. That is not going to get us there. So let's see how it, how it jams into the body. Uh, it's a loose fit, so definitely a loose fit. So we're going to have to do work with some adhesive and we'll get on to that job next. All right, let's drill through the hand. Now here's the thing. I'm going to drill from both sides and hope and pray that I can meet in the middle. Let's see how I do. Perfect. Perfection. And that's how you do it. And that's how you do it. Nice. If you drill from one side, there's just no way you're going to come out Lord knows where. If I drill in from both sides, works perfect. Yep. Yep. Gonna work fine. All right, next step. What a fine arm. Hello. Hello, he's waving at you. Wait, hold it, he's waving at you. That's a little long, but we'll trim it. Don't worry about it, we're gonna trim it. It's gonna be beautiful, okay. All right, let's comp this thing together so we can begin to approximate where we're going with things. So he's pretty well driven down into that base. It's pretty strong, actually. All right, now let's see if we can't fit these arms. See if we can have not have the head fly off because it's really teetering on there. It's not attached in any way. Just gravity, the force and the power and the majesty of the planet Earth holding it in place. Okay, so this is the hand that's going to be holding the stringus in front of him. Now, how long is that? Is that ridiculously too long? Yeah, that's probably ridiculously too long. I could turn his head that way, like that. Of course, it's completely out of balance, but I could turn his head that way and then put this like that. Let's take a look at the hand. this hand position. That's not good. This hand needs to be much more, okay, okay, about trimmed more like to there. The other one could be like that. This is a little ridiculously out of scale looking hand until you put the head on and then all of a sudden the arm doesn't look so ridiculously out of scale. Now does it? So we're going to do the hands last because we're going to fit the kite string to the hands and not vice versa. And his arm looks ridiculous, one short one long until you put his head on and then you see why. He needs to be extremely malleable, and he's going to be looking back like that, sort of like that. I haven't even hung the other foot on, don't have his socks on. The other foot's going to be out like that. So he's going to be ripping right along, pulling a kite. Very cute. It turned out that the trick to fitting the hands was to have a lot of slack in the string, <laughs> which is funnier, fortunately, uh, but also it made it possible to adjust the hands a lot easier. So that worked out pretty good. That worked out well. I made this palette four days ago, and it is as wet and as workable as it was the day I made it. It's working as advertised. Let's get this paint job going. I primed the arms, and now hey, we will paint them. Hey, thanks for watching the video. I hope you got something out of it. Hope okay, we're down it. to little details. See you in the next one. I haven't painted the kite string yet, and I haven't figured out the color. <laughs> Uh, that's the kind of stuff I leave at the last minute, but I do think I'm going to paint the inside of this collar black. Not that you're really going to see it much. I mean, mostly blocked by the head. But you'll kind of see it. <clears throat> All right, let's get a little drop of glue and stick the head on. Get it to the right angle. That's uh, about right. I'm kind of looking back. 
And then I just needed to put a little more detail on the kite. So I wanted to put the crossbow and the string and paint that yellow, which I thought was the best color for it. Seemed to work out. You know, it's an interesting thing about the details, little things like this, to kind of have to match the sculpture. Uh, up close, just in isolation, these things look a little bit kind of crude and cartoony. But I really think they work well in the context of the whole sculpture. So they didn't need to be more detailed or more uh, rendered out than these simple little shapes. They worked well. Well, here's our boy. All done. Ready to go. <laughs> ah, yes. So magnificent. So beautiful.